He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates that the Father has set by his own authority. But you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. 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 So it is my pleasure to introduce to you our new friend, Brett Robertson, and he is coming to give a witness to the work of the risen Christ in his life today. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Brett, and I am an alcoholic and an addict. It is only by the grace of God that I am standing up here today to speak to you. There was a time in my life where I was just uh, hopeless, and I was helpless. Um, the only, <coughs> the only uh, point of life was just to get through it. Uh, growing up, I wasn't a bad kid. I was heavily involved in sports, and I was an honorable student in high school. It's not like I grew up with the wrong crowd either. Most of my friends are successful college graduates. We smoked a little bit of marijuana and we drank here and there. Nothing too bad. But I was putting all that hope into a future of sports. And uh, when I graduated in 2008, um, I got injured and I needed surgery. And that kind of depleted all my hopes and dreams of ever competing on a professional level. My identity was sports. It was who I was. It was what I knew. Uh, so when I went off to college, I needed an, an identity and I needed friends. Uh, so I pledged a fraternity, and we partied a lot. And I partied a lot because uh, I was uncomfortable with who I was. I couldn't be in crowds of people. I'm a little uh, anxious being here, standing up and talking to you all. Uh, alcohol helped that. Alcohol helped me be comfortable in my own skin, is what we like to say. Uh, but we, I partied so much uh, that I was suspended in just my second semester for uh, underage possession of alcohol. <coughs> When I came back to Northern Virginia, I definitely started hanging out with the wrong crowd. Uh, I hung out with people who did painkillers, and I remembered what it was like to do them when I had surgery, and I enjoyed them. Uh, and I enjoyed them again. The drug addiction interfered with me going to school, so I stopped that. I stopped going to school because it was pointless for me to leave every 45 minutes to get high in the bathroom in my car, so I just decided to not go anymore. <laughs> I was able to somehow to keep a job um, to support my habit, but once again, I lost that too. I ran into someone uh, who I knew was involved in heroin, or with heroin, and uh, I asked if he could help me get some, because being a drug addict, we're always looking for the better fix, the cheaper fix, and heroin was both. And as soon as I uh, did it for the first time, I, I fell in love. Do you, do you know what it's like to feel helpless and, and hopeless? Heroin was the center of my life. I couldn't eat, sleep, shower, I couldn't do anything without first getting high. It was who I was. I'm sure you would do anything for your children, your family, and your friends. I would do that to make sure I would get high. I stopped caring about my health, my friends, and my family. If you couldn't help me get heroin, I, I just didn't want you in my life. I was a master manipulator. Um, that is something I still work on on a daily basis. Um, so I could manipulate anybody or anything, any place to help me get money or help me get drugs. After three months of hard won sobriety, uh, with going to meetings with my sponsor and working uh, the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, a friend invited me to church. 
the very first service I ever went to, the young adult pastor spoke on Matthew 11, 28. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. After hearing the message of love and acceptance and that God wanted every part of me, no matter what I had to offer, I was convicted of my sins. Mark Dever writes, to be convicted of your sins would be the best gift you could ever get, because that is the starting point of a new relationship with God, a reconciled relationship with Him. It has been the best gift I've ever gotten. I believed that I was condemned in my sin, and I needed deliverance from my bondage. And that deliverance came through the blood of Jesus Christ and the support of my community. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we, may, we might become the righteousness of God. If you're not a Christian, or even if you are a Christian, God wants us to trust him. To believe that Jesus paid that penalty for us. To bear our sin and all of our guilt and shame. Because of our rebellion against God, we all deserve that punishment. But God, in his faithful love, put that punishment on Christ. I was so ashamed of who I became. I couldn't stop using drugs, even though I struggled time and time again. I would look myself in the mirror. I promise myself, you're not going to get high today. Just to find myself an hour later, getting high. After becoming a believer, I still had cravings. But God is the... Uh, provider of endless resources. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, No temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with temptation, you will be able, sorry, but with temptation, you will also provide a way out so that you may be able to bear. At this time, I was well connected with uh, my sponsor and fellow um, members of Alcoholics Anonymous. God has provided me with uh, these guys that would pick me up because I didn't have a license, um, would take me to meetings, would help me share about my feelings, the cravings, the reasons why I still wanted to get high. I was so devoted to a life full of drugs that my mind still craved the high even months after being sober. <clears throat> I had a hole in me that I was trying to fill with all the wrong places, or with all the wrong things. Drugs, alcohol, uh, women, um, but I was, I, uh, God is the only one that can provide that. God is the only one that can provide that love that I needed, that I was trying to look for in drugs and in alcohol. The odds against achieving a flawless recovery are very high. Um, after I had left rehab in January <laughs> 2017, I relapsed a couple times. Uh, before my sobriety date, which is in February of 2017. However, many recovering addicts still manage uh, their disease the way diabetics manage their blood sugar, or people with hypertension uh, manage their blood pressure imperfectly, but uh, successfully. Uh, addiction is a spiritual illness, and it is also a, a physical illness. It needs God's healing, but it also needs proper, proper medical care and treatment resources. Uh, I was lucky to find that community that welcomed me and helped me um, be able to do things like this, to be able to be comfortable with who I am, uh, to be able to tell my story. I was, uh, at first I was afraid because a lot of people are shunned and turned away because of drug addiction and the disease. <coughs> But hope is available to everyone who suffers. I treat my addiction by praying, going to meetings, uh, talking to my sponsor, working steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, but most importantly, um, reaching my help, reaching my hand out to when someone asks for help. Uh, like our mission statement is um, helping another alcoholic to achieve sobriety, and someone did that for me. I first meeting I ever went to, I shared that I needed help, and my sponsor is still my sponsor today. Came to me. And, and stuck his hand out. So that is my, my goal inside these rooms. Uh, having faith in Christ has made my recovery possible. Uh, to be able to lean on God during trials and sufferings, <clears throat> casting all of my cares on Him because He cares for me, uh, to praise Him when prayers are answered, and just by how good He is. I was, I was always afraid to look to God uh, just because I was so disgusted with who I was. 
that I didn't believe he sought out the sick, the hopeless, and the helpless. Uh, but now I know that God loves to heal broken people and use them to do his work. It's because I've been through the despair of drug addiction that I can be God's hands and reach back and help my fellow man through it too. Uh, it's really been a pleasure to come up here and share my story uh, about faith and recovery. Thank you. So truly, nothing really needs to be added to that. Amen? Amen. Amen. But i got to tie this into a mission celebration next week, so here we go. Um, I want to talk to you about witnesses, about being witnesses and what that looks like. The, the end of the Gospels and the closing chapters and verses of all four Gospels are filled with witness accounts to the risen Jesus when he just walks through locked doors, when he's cooking breakfast on the beach, when he appears to two people on their way to a nearby town called Emmaus. And Brett's witness this morning, thank you so much, Brett, but it reminds us that the risen Christ still makes appearances still today, that he still walks with us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And our reading for today from the book of Acts is usually reserved for Ascension Sunday and the calendar of the church year. Uh, it's the Sunday before Pentecost, uh, but this year that Sunday falls on Mother's Day, and we know which takes precedence there. Um, but also in our preaching plans, um, we're planning to preach on the portion of 1 Corinthians that speaks about sexual immorality. So you won't want to miss that mashup, Mother's Day and sexual immorality. The kids bring your mamas, and mamas bring your kids. Heaven help us. But Jesus instructs the disciples in Acts chapter 1 to wait in Jerusalem for the pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon them. And they ask him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he says it, that it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It's as if he said, Daddy's got this under control. And it's not for you to worry about that. In the meantime, there's something for y'all to do. And I think Jesus is saying at least three things here. First, you might notice the emphasis in the second reading. <laughs> You see, they're as expecting Jesus still to do it all. Lord, are you at this time going to, to do this? And, and why not? Because Jesus can do it all. He often does it all. But in the grand scheme of things, God actually chooses to partner with us instead of just doing it all himself. God always initiates, but grace always demands a response. God always calls, but we have to answer. And God has a plan, but we all have a part to play. See, the power of the Holy Spirit is for each of us, not just the pastor, not just the, the a few select people, but for everyone. And as such, all of us are called to witness, to give testimony to the work of the risen Christ in our world and in our lives. You might say, well, I can't do that because I don't have an amazing story like Brett's. They were at the first service. It's okay. They, they can, they can <laughs> and they're coming to the third service, too. Uh, but, but you say, I can't do that. I don't have an amazing story like Brett's. And, and you're exactly right. You don't. If you're in recovery or in similar circumstances, there might be similarities to your story and Brett's story, but his story is his story, and your story is yours. Think about the different witnesses in a courtroom. You have the eyewitnesses that tell about what they directly saw with their own two eyes or what they had experienced in, in whatever situation happened. But that's not the only testimony, and in some instances, it's not the most important testimony, even. 
You have the detectives who arrived after the fact. And they examine the scene and they give witness based on their observations. You have forensic scientists who give witness based on close examination and, and on and on. You see, the point of it is, there's more than one way to witness. You might know that Jesus doesn't specify how we are to witness. He just says, do it. As the Holy Spirit comes on each of us, the Spirit gives gifts of the Spirit according to the Spirit, not according to us. It's not a case of, God, please give me this gift. I really want this gift. It would be so cool to have that gift. Or more often than not, God, please don't give me this gift. I really do not want this gift. It's not up to us. It's up to God. Some are gifted with amazing stories like Brett. Some are gifted with the gift of evangelism. And they witness in that way. I like to think of myself more as that detective arriving to the scene, drawing conclusions and telling it in my own words and my own experience and witnessing in that way. Some people don't witness with words at all, but through acts of service. But if you ask them why they do what they do, they say it's because of the risen Jesus and what he's done in my life. Some witness through missionary work, like you'll hear next weekend in our missions celebration. I hope you will come and hear how the risen Jesus is at work throughout our world. Some witness through the work of social justice, offering legal aid to people that can't otherwise afford it, advocating for laws that literally save lives. Just because we don't have a story like Brett's, or just because someone else might not serve in the same way we're called to serve, does not diminish our witness or theirs. For each of us are called in our own way, and Jesus didn't specify, he just said, do it. But where? You might say, well, I surely don't have time or money to go overseas and be a missionary. I don't even have time to take off and go to a short-term mission trip to Poland, to Paraguay, or wherever we're going with a P that starts next. <laughs> but you don't have to, to do that. Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In our mission celebration, we celebrate our, especially our international uh, missionaries and mission work that Pender has done for decades in so many places around the world, almost literally the ends of the earth or close to it. We've done well in Judea and Samaria in, in our regions around us, especially in strong partnerships in places like Philippi, West Virginia. <coughs> but what about Jerusalem? A lot of us are reading together through a book called Canoeing the Mountains. And the author Todd Bolsinger points out that a church that has done so well with international missions often finds it hard to witness locally. How are we doing in our own neighborhood and our witnesses there? I remember in uh, the year of church planting, it was all kinds of fun because we had a two to three year old little escape artist little boy who loved to take off running out the door and down the street, and most of the time we would find them in the neighbor's backyard standing on the ladder staring into their above-ground pool. Nice little heart attack waiting to happen on mom and dad's part there. And so, you know, my voice carries, especially my dad voice, and I remember the thinking and, and telling to Becca the first time that my dad voice echoed off of the neighbor's houses. Great, that'll make people want to come to our church. Me yelling at my kids. <laughs> Maybe not the best witness there. But as a church, how are we doing at witnessing in our neighborhood? Butch Canerney has the spiritual gift of church signage. <laughs> he, he, he's the one that changes our church sign out front, comes up with most of the, the sayings out there. Sometimes he texts me and says, should I put this? No, tone it down a little bit, Butch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right there with you most of the time. But, you know. 
But actually, Joyce Munt and Office will tell you the number of phone calls we get from people who commute on 50, who have driven by, some of whom have said, I'm an atheist, but if I went to church, I would go to your church because of your sign out front. <laughs> but Bishop Pennell, our bishop a few times back, I heard him say one time that he had a problem with church signs as he would travel all around the conference, that uh, he would see all kinds of church signs and 90% of them almost always advertise just the latest fundraiser. And he said, nothing says, come worship the risen Christ with us, like spaghetti supper, Saturday night at six, seven dollars at the door. <laughs> or saying is that only church people find funny. This church is prayer conditioned. <laughs> <laughs> Or cryptic sayings. <laughs> yeah, don't use that one, Bush. <laughs> or cryptic messages. Bishop Pendle said he finally saw a sign that said, Sins forgiven here. He said, Wow, that's a church that gets it. That's a church that knows what it means to give witness to the risen Christ. And so even as we celebrate our witness through mission uh, for decades throughout our world, a goal we set as a church for 2018 is to partner in a stronger way with the Chris Atwood Foundation. They're our people for crying out loud here at Pender, and we want to, to strengthen that partnership with the great work that they're doing in reaching out to those in addiction and in recovery, to, to witness in a new and different and exciting way even by just starting out by raising awareness, by bringing in people like Brett to share. And, and he shared, I want to hit it again in case you didn't hear it. He said, I was always afraid to look to God because I was just so disgusted with who I was. That I didn't believe he sought out the hopeless and the helpless. But now I know that God loves to heal broken people and use them to do his work. <coughs> and friends, let me tell you, even if you think you don't. I guarantee that you know someone who struggles or has struggled with some sort of addiction. If for no other reason, then you know me. You know someone in your life who is or has been disgusted with who they are or who they were. Someone who needs to know and to hear that sins are forgiven here by a God who loves them unconditionally. Friends, this is a mission field. Not only here in our own backyard, but in our families and our households as well. And it's a mission field that you can help reach Wednesday night, April 25th, is our next brainstorming planning meeting as we continue to pray and discern how God is calling us to be in ministry with those in addiction and recovery. Wednesday night, April 25th, 7.30 in the library. But maybe you're not called to that particular work of witnessing to the risen Christ in that way. Well, friends, you're not off the hook either. Because my invitation to you then is to pray. Ask God, what's the way that you're calling me to witness to the work of the risen Christ in my life and in the world around me? Brett shared with me right before worship this morning. He's in, in children's ministry over at McLean Bible Church is where he's been serving in ministry. And he said that a statistic shows that if a child does not hear the gospel, by their high school graduation, the chances are higher than 70% that they will never hear it in their lifetime. Staggering. We're called to be witnesses, each of us. We're called to witness in many wonderful and varied ways. And we're called to be witnesses in these fields of mission in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our community, in our nation, and in our world around us. Thanks be to God for this calling. 
for this amazing opportunity that he puts before us.